Great. Uh, thank you very much, Mark and Diego, uh, Claudia. It's wonderful uh, to be here and to welcome all of you to Tiller House. Um, I can think of no better way to spend my days off in between jobs than uh, here for Human Rights Month with, with uh, these friends from ASIL and WCL. Um, I got my undergraduate degree in history. And as I was thinking about today's uh, panel discussion, I was thinking about that and the fact that I still love history and uh, approach law as a historian um, and love thinking about law in a historical frame. And so I was particularly excited to be invited to moderate this, this discussion today, which is really going to uh, take a historical frame to uh, international human rights law, in particular to framing documents in international human rights law, the Universal and the American Declaration of Human Rights, uh, of which we celebrate the 70th anniversary this year. And uh, I think anniversaries are important. It's interesting to think back about uh, what that history has done, uh, has meant, how it's shaped the law, um, what the framers might have expected, what they thought it was that they were doing 70 years ago, whether we have lived up to those expectations or not, what that tells us about lawmaking, and what it tells us about the future and what we should be doing today, um, learning from their experience. So uh, those are the topics and any that you may have brought with you um, that we're gonna dig into today. Uh, I'll introduce our panel, and then we've agreed to have a pretty informal discussion among us about those topics, and really want it to be a round table, a round room kind of discussion that, that invites all of you uh, to chime in, share your perspectives uh, and experience and questions as well. So let me introduce a very distinguished panel. We really are incredibly fortunate to have these three individuals to help us dig into this topic. I'll start on my far left, your right. We have uh, Tom Bergenthal, who is uh, a professor at uh, GW Law School, um, which he, he's been in that role since 1989. And before that was associated, of course, with Washington College of Law at AU, where he served as dean. Um, he's also had endowed professorships at the University of Texas and Emory University. And um, um, perhaps most uh, uh, interesting uh, for today's discussion, he also served as judge and president of the Inter-American Court of Human Rights and as president of the Administrative Tribunal of the Inter-American Development Bank. Um, he was a member of the UN Human Rights Committee and the UN Truth Commission uh, for El Salvador. And he also, of course, uh, uh, served for uh, a decade as uh, a judge in the International Court of Justice in The Hague. Um, then uh, to Tom's right, uh, we have uh, Margaret May McCauley, who's president of the Inter-American uh, Commission on Human Rights. She's been a commissioner um, there since uh, 2015 will serve until 2019. Previously, she served as a judge of the Inter-American Court of Human Rights from 2007 to 2012, and uh, contributed to the court's jurisprudence as well as its uh, development of its rules of procedure. Um, she is particularly known as a champion of women's rights, is an honored member of the Gender Justice Legacy Wall at the UN, um, she has uh, been instrumental in law reform in her native uh, Jamaica, and particularly as a, a strong proponent of women's rights there. And finally, um, to my immediate left, we have Robert Goldman, who's a professor of law and Louis C. James Scholar at American University, Washington College of Law, where he has uh, served in one role or another for almost 50 years, I noted in your bio. Um, Bob also has a long and distinguished career in addition to serving um, on the faculty and as acting dean at WCL. He, uh, he has served in a number of international human rights roles. Um, he chaired the Commission of International Jurists on the Administration of Justice in Peru. Uh, and he uh, also worked um, uh, in, in framing another key document in international human rights law, the guiding principles on inter internal displacement. Might be interesting to probe the, uh, a comparison between 
those guiding principles and, and these other aspirational documents we're talking about today. Um, he was a member of the Inter-American Commission on Human Rights and served as its president um, from 1999 to 2000. Um, he was the former UN Human Rights Commission's independent expert on the protection of human rights and fundamental freedoms while countering terrorism. And he uh, has served in the leadership of the International Commission of Jurists and a number of other international human rights organizations. So we are in good hands for this discussion today. Um, let me then turn to our topic. And maybe to get us in the historical mood, I thought as I was on my way down here and thinking about this topic, I thought, I wonder what was being said about these documents at the ASIL annual meeting in 1949, right after they were concluded. And were they even mentioned at the ASIL annual meeting? And so I got here a few minutes early and dashed into the library and then resorted to the computer, uh, which was more efficient, uh, to, to, to pull up the proceedings from April of 1949. And indeed, there was a whole morning devoted to human rights law at that meeting in 1949. And it was, uh, it was quite remarkable at that time. This was a meeting that Manly O. Hudson was inducted as the president of the society, and Justice Jackson was the keynote speaker. Um, anyhow, at, at the inter I'll just share with you the remarks that were made at the introduction of this morning session on international human rights law at the 1949 meeting. And it's striking because the, the, the individual who was introducing the panel, Mr. Arthur K. Kuhn, um, who is Honorary Vice President of the Society, he was very apologetic about this topic. He starts this way. Uh, Members of the Society and distinguished guests, we continue the program that was so auspiciously commenced last night and continued here this morning. If in the year the Society was founded at our first meeting, we had placed on our program the discussion of the subject of human rights, I feel sure that some captious critic might very well have charged us with pursuing some phase of transcendentalism. However, our world, over the period of the last 40 years, has grown appreciably smaller in relation to the relative elements of time and distance, and populations have increased throughout the world. That's the vice president going there. <laughs> Do you think I'm joking? Well, wait, we'll wait for Vice President Pence. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> more protection than food. So anyhow, he, 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 he remarks, however, our world over the past 40 years has grown appreciably smaller in relation to the relative elements of time and distance, and populations have increased throughout the world. Accordingly, a denial of fundamental human rights anywhere tends to create conditions dangerous to international peace. And therefore, it was justified to be addressed at the ASIL annual meeting. <laughs> so um, as I say, that puts us in the historical mood and, and I think is quite interesting for framing my first question to our panel. And, um, I'll throw it out there and invite any of you to jump in. And if you're shy, which I doubt will be the case, I will, um, I'll start calling on folks. But, but, uh, but I thought we'd begin by really trying to cast ourselves back um, in time and ask each of you to reflect a little bit on what these documents have meant for international human rights law. And uh, how, have th how have they contributed to the development of the law? And how are their histories and impacts different one from the other? Yeah. Go ahead, Margaret. I don't mind saying a few words. I think we may have to turn yeah. your, is it on? There's a little switch on the top. Yeah. It should be on. I switched it on, yeah. Um, I, I, I will just say a few words. I should apologize because I have had a long day and without any wine. Um, so I'm feeling rather frail <laughs> at the moment. But I, I was interested to hear you say about your first um, degree being in history. That's what I 
applied to do uh, first, and then my headmistress at my convent in England said, Margaret, I understand you've applied for history. What do you expect to do with it? And so I said, something, <laughs> you know? I love it. And she says, no, the kind, the Margaret I know would not be happy <laughs> to do history. And uh, so he said, she said, told me to think again. And when I told her I'd applied for law, she says, now you're talking. <laughs> yeah. So um, that's how I came not to do history. But I am a practitioner. I'm uh, um, not an acad academic, nor a historian, even though I still love history myself. Um, but I think we have to remember about these two documents that they came because uh, we just come out of this horrendous Second World War. And, and people were feeling quite unsafe and didn't want another uh, um, war like that ever happening again. And we talk about the genocide that um, happened, um, which I think is, was not the greatest genocide in the world, but that it was the one that has the most attention. And definitely, I think it um, awakened the conscience of people that we had to treat with each other uh, very well. So they, they had to come up with normative standards for how we should behave with each other in the hopes that we will not annihilate each other um, as, as the last war had, uh, had um, seemed as if it would that that would happen. And, and I think one of the things too is that I find it unfortunate that the Inter-American uh, um, Declaration came first in time. And yet I have found in the years that I've been in, in the system and before I came into the system um, that very few people know this as a fact uh, and, and um, are surprised um, about it indeed within the hemisphere where it's applicable. Very few people know that it is so. I have talked to, gone to universities and lots of the professors don't even know that fact. And it surprises me uh, um, because I think it's uh, a fact that one ought to be proud about and ought to hold high. And because it's an amazing document, an amazing document that a large number of countries within our system uh, um, have to answer to the violations which they commit against the citizens because eventually the commission got jurisdiction to deal with these matters. We would uh, talk about that um, some other time. Could the, I just yeah. Yeah. Are you, I'm sure I know you are, you, you know, this okay. is a chat. Well, <laughs> <Yes>. <laughs> I, I thought I it's appropriate to give you a little historical background. Right. Yeah. Um, okay. Because uh, you should, we, let me start with one thing so that we demythanize the Universal Declaration. At, in San Francisco. Oh, oh, oh. yes. I'm glad you did it because I can never handle these things. <laughs> in San Francisco, when the uh, UN Charter was drafted, uh, there were a number of countries and a number of NGOs who wanted to get a human rights treaty drafted. Uh, there was great opposition to that. The United States, uh, the Soviet Union, the UK, France, all the good countries in those days. <laughs> And so, as a sort of compromise, they said, well, uh, we won't do anything now, but once the UN is established and there, we'll draft a treaty. Well, the treaty was not drafted, and the Universal Declaration became a sort of excuse that was assumed would not do any harm. Or, and Mrs. Roosevelt, who was appointed to, to chair the body and was the US representative, in fact was instructed by the State Department, and she didn't like many instructions, and that one also she didn't like, 
to basically don't do anything that makes this instrument binding. So that was sort of the, uh, the beginning. And in fact, the Universal Declaration, when it was adopted, the assumption was this is just something that's never going to have any significance whatsoever. It gained significance, and we can now stop, uh, because then when the covenants entered into force, uh, it began to lose its importance in terms of developing human rights, but it was vital, of vital importance at the time when the UN was established, because the UN Articles 55 and 56 speak of human rights, and nobody quite knew what that was. And many states used it as an excuse when they were charged with violating human rights. They said, well, we don't really know what it means. So the Universal Declaration helped tell them uh, uh, what it meant. Um, so that, that's, the, that's the background, and the history really has been one of transformation. This instrument developed as something that was deemed to be totally unimportant, and over the years has become very important, and I think we'll fill you in on this. Let me stop here. Tom, can I just ask one follow-up? What can you tell us about that, that, that history and the sequencing that uh, Margaret mentioned that the uh, American Declaration came first. Did it inform the, the discussions in Geneva? Well, I, I should tell you that is a myth. I'm sorry to tell you that. The, uh, actually, it was adopted before, but it, it, uh, the Universal uh, Declaration already existed, and the uh, Americans, uh, Latin Americans and others, jumped the gun and declared it, but in fact, much of what you have in the, in, in the American Declaration is also drawn uh, from the Universal Declaration. But, many, but there's much more in it, which is very important, uh, a lot of important. So we'll, we'll, we'll yes. pursue me, that in a minute. Let, let me just add another thing. Uh, in, in terms of the date, really, the, that's mm -hmm. the, uh, yeah. they both, it's the fact that the Universal Declaration affected directly the American Declaration but the American Declaration order included some very important issues, namely things relating to economic rights and other things. So it's a, became a, and it became an, a very important document we can, which we can discuss later. All right, Bob, why don't you jump in? Well, yeah, there's some very different backgrounds than anyone who really wants to know about this. Tom is very bashful, but uh, uh, Tom has written extensively uh, uh, about it and and. Uh, despite their different origins, and there's some very interesting things in terms of the Inter-American Declaration, and it is true, I think the Universal Declaration, we, we, we came out of this horrible uh, uh, situation of World War II with the horrors of the Axis occupations and so forth, which, you know, linked to that reform, for instance, of the law of war. Right. And at the same time, we got the Geneva Conventions and so forth because of these horrors of occupation and of course the Holocaust and the like. So this was very much in the minds, I think, of many of the people who were pushing for this. But in the inter-American system, without elaborating, uh, there are some real peculiarities and also the motivation of many Latin American states was very different. The non-intervention issue and so forth was a key thing and, and I've written somewhat about that. Uh, but the thing is, uh, one of the interesting things in the American Declaration, which really never sort of went into fruition, was the notion of individual responsibilities. I mean, we know that human rights law is essentially addressed at states and its agents in principle and so forth, and not at the conduct of private parties and so forth and so on. Uh, but I think uh, normatively, and I'll just throw this out, uh, they're very similar paths in the sense that, that uh, uh, they helped uh, the, the Declaration, the Inter-American Declaration, quite clearly helped to define what the human rights obligations would be for member states of the Organization of American States. Again, Tom has written extensively in terms of the various kinds of reforms of the OAS Charter, whether or not the Declaration is incorporated by reference or whatever, we certainly do understand that the Universal Declaration played a very clear role because of Articles 55, 56 in defining what would essentially be these aspirational guides in terms of human rights and fundamental freedoms. And then both very similarly gave rise to the hard law, that is the two treaties, splitting off 
Uh, we got the American, uh, uh, the American Convention on Human Rights, later the Convention on Economic, Social, and Cultural, 1966. We got the uh, uh, two covenants, we got the International Bill of Rights, and so forth. Let, let me mention what I think, because uh, I've tried to think about this uh, in some of the questions that you pose. And to me, I think the most salient thing is how these documents really changed the face of international law. Uh, 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 it really moved international law from a completely state-centric to a more people-centric uh, approach. It endowed individuals with limited international legal personality. Now an individual, uh, you know, just they, could, they had no standing to press claims and so forth and so on. Now an individual could, with the emergence of the complaint procedures and so forth, uh, was endowed with uh, you know, certain inalienable rights by virtue of their humanity and not nationality. That was a very, very, and, and this we've seen developed also with the right to protect, the notion that the primary duty of a state is to secure free exercise of rights if it's unwilling or unable. In other words, we've seen a diminution of sovereignty which is based on this. So I think that is extremely important. Uh, one of the things that people don't really talk about all that much, because we tend to take a very legalistic thing, but I know in speaking sort of for the organization that I represent now, the International Commission of Jurists, is these two documents gave rise to the modern civil society movement. I, I, I mean, you can trace the birth and so forth and so on of NGOs at the national, now we had ACLUs, we had other things like that. But really, uh, if you look today and you trace back and you see how many uh, non-governmental organizations have consultative status and so forth with the council and, and, and before with the commission, uh, you name a right in the declaration or in the universal declaration, there's an NGO at every level that is pushing the, the agenda. And, and this is extremely important because NGOs have emerged as the principal catalyst in upholding human rights and mobilizing shame, and particularly with organizations uh, uh, participating with states in updating the law, new standard setting, and so forth. And I really think that it would be a source of uh, surprise and I think delight to people like Mrs. Roosevelt and John Humphrey and a variety of other people that uh, not only have we internationalized the subject of human rights, but virtually human rights is part of the everyday discourse of states in the world today. Bilaterally, regionally, and internationally. So if Trump doesn't raise human rights or whatever when he goes to Singapore or whatever about press freedom, or if you know, Obama didn't raise certain, or if the Brits go somewhere and they don't raise it, they're going to be domestic constituency, they're going to be organizations and so forth. So this is extremely important. This has been mainstreamed, you know. This is mainstream today. So these are things I think we can explore, but as I said, if I sat back and I would say, did they think, given the skepticism and so forth and so on, in foreign offices in the very beginning, they didn't want, even in the Carter, they, I mean, the career diplomats didn't want this stuff. But anyways, we've come a long way in, 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 in that respect. So these two documents gave rise to a movement and to hard law to the point today that we have thousands of hard law and soft law instruments, mechanisms, special rapporteurs, working groups, and so forth and so on uh, that I think have been uh, uh, you know, very, very effective, particularly given the scant resources. So. Okay. Well, so we won't be hearing uh, apologetic introductions of human rights panels at the ASIL meetings uh, today. But, uh, and, and I think this is really interesting framing and some unexpected outcomes of those documents 70 years ago, even though they were intended to be non-binding, they've given rise to hard law and, and mechanisms of enforcement. They've spawned a civil society movement that is very effective and creative. Um, all of that would probably surprise and please the founders. What would disappoint them about this seven, past 70 years? Well, uh, let me say a word about that. Uh, you know, it's wonderful to talk about how much we've accomplished, but uh, how much we haven't accomplished. Yeah. 
for example, uh, I take Asia, for example. Uh, there does not exist a regional Asian human rights uh, group. But there are hardly any NGOs there. And very few of Asian countries, which is very large, have ratified any major human rights treaties. And uh, to some extent, that is true also, uh, certainly in the Middle East, but also to some extent, to lesser extent, however, in, in Africa, where things are really uh, beginning to move. But there's still a long way to go. And even countries that, that have ratified human rights instruments still continue to violate human rights extensively. So, you know, let's, so the job today is really to focus on the implementation uh, of these rights. Uh, we couldn't have focused on that if it hadn't been for these instruments. But now that we have them, we better not get too optimistic. And we need to really make sure that, the, that they are implemented properly. And for the most part, in many countries, they are not implemented. And I think it's also important to note that the United States has ratified very few instruments uh, and as a result has actually affected also the outcome and the attitudes of various other countries where if the U.S. had been a party to various of these instruments, many other countries would have joined. Mm -hmm. uh, and you know, that's a long history why the U.S. didn't join. It mm -hmm. started with, uh, with our problems uh, black and white problems, uh, and uh, we're still there for some reason, but uh, so, and there are other countries, the Soviet Union, of course, has hardly done, and it seems to continue even under a different name nowadays, and they haven't done very much either in the field, but on the other hand, there, for example, the European Convention of Human Rights, the European Court of Human Rights, uh, to some extent what's happening in, in, the, in, in Latin America, Inter-American Commission and Court are doing things, and also the African Commission and now the, the new court that has been established. Things are beginning to move. But there's still a lot. The rest of the world is still there, and not that much is happening. So those of you who are interested in NGO work, you have a lot of work to you. Yeah. So uh, go, go ahead. I, I just I just wanted to say um, in relation to Asia. Um, in my, um, the, oh, what should I say? In the women's, when I was in the women's movement, I was always a volunteer, and an individual volunteer. And then I'll end up being president of the, of the organization, not by any choice or pushing myself forward, but anyway. But I met a lot of NGOs from Asia. There are a lot of them there. And, but, but because they, they don't have a regional body, and they have been trying to get one going for a number of years, because I've been to the area to speak to various groups about it when they've invited me to talk about how they can set up. But, but they, they, when I act under the universal system, because of course that is there, uh, and, and some of the, the basic instruments in the universal system have been ratified by some of their countries. So they do act on that. But I think it behoves us, where well, we have regional systems, to uh, assist them to set up a regional system there. Because I think that's one of the things we ought to have a sense of responsibility in assisting others to have the means to protect their rights. Well, I think what the difficulty with this is that, you know, the, the, the concept of Westerners, and as you very know, that they I take am, a I'm not but, looked on as no, a no, Westerner. No, no, but no, no. <laughs> but I'm just saying that the notion of Westerners telling the Asians the kind of system that they should have and so forth. Uh, uh, I've worked with some of these. I had a, I had a superb uh, person from the foreign ministry in, in Vietnam as an SJD student and so forth who was working on his whole thesis. He had first been at Notre Dame, and we discussed a lot of these things. What, how do you approach these things? How do you sort of sell this? Where there, you know, I mean, there's a cultural difference in terms of things and so forth. Uh, so it's, uh, it, it, it is a challenge. Let me raise one other thing that I think also plays into this. And Tom indicated, we have more law than we've ever had in history, quite clearly. 
I mean, we have so many instruments. And what happens is, particularly law students, because all the case books feature because so many people have not practiced in the area, but they just love substantive legal decision. So they look at decision, and it's very important. But they seem to forget that the whole point of human rights law and human rights supervision is, is complementary. Domestic implementation is the fundamental thing that one must achieve. And we've seen, I've seen in Latin America in the years that I've been there, and I think Tom and all of us sitting on the court, we've seen major constitutional reforms after periods of exceptionalism and so forth, where Argentina, Uruguay, other countries coming out of dictatorships uh, ratified the American Convention. Then they had constitutional uh, reforms. And actually, very importantly, that these norms, and this happened also with the fall of communism in a variety of countries, they were given the rank of constitutional of constitutionality, no domestic law, and so forth. And the courts at different times and so forth we've seen would look at the decisions of like the Inter-American Court or wherever in Europe or, and, and, and the like. That where I think is a lot of the focus uh, must be. And courts are no better than the people, let's, let's, let's be frank, courts are no better than the people who sit on them. They, 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 they you know, demystify these things. You have progressive courts, and then you have other kinds of courts. We've looked at the, I've looked at the Constitutional Court in Colombia under different periods of time, and then you look at it at different periods, and my gosh, they're very, very different. You took the little U.S. Supreme Court today compared to uh, a, a very close friend of mine is uh, the late Chief Justice uh, Arthur Chaskelson, who was one of the giants of 20th century law. Uh, 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 and, and he told me, you know, we used to look to the United States Supreme Court all the time for guidance. And he said, no one is looking at it now. Mm -hmm. I mean, it, 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 it's not the beacon it once was. It doesn't, so, you know, and maybe someday it will again become on some of these things. But I think one has to, in effect, I think, focus much more in entrenching these things uh, domestically. Uh, we've seen in Latin America, again, in many countries, uh, in Argentina, for example, in Colombia, every major law school teaches human rights, and they're even having clinics and so forth and so on. That is the key to me, is domestic implementation, and, but that presupposes that you have a country that respects and cherishes the rule of law. And what we're seeing today from Washington to Moscow to Turkey to Hungary uh, to the Philippines and so forth, uh, the emergence of leaders and political parties uh, that uh, are openly hostile to international institutions and the very notion of the rule of law and particularly an independent judiciary. And if there's one thing that is required that we know under human rights law is you need domestically a strong and independent civilian judiciary to act as a break. Yeah. And we're seeing everywhere removal of judges, threatening of judges, and so forth, whether it's from Washington or pardoning of people who violate the rule of law, and so forth and so on. And this is a major, major problem. Because if you don't respect the stuff domestically, you're not going to respect it internationally. Great. Chime in. I didn't, uh, thank you guys for coming and talking about um, what I think is a pretty impressive matter. I just want to quickly follow up. Thank you. Quickly follow up on your question. Um, my name is Simone. I'm a uh, recent graduate from SAIS uh, down the road. Yeah. Um, I guess my question to you is I totally agree. And I think it's something that needs to be brought up more across the world. How do we address the challenge or the hindrance, I would think, to countries that want to implement these things, but they have the dilemma of this socio-cultural background that sort of contrasts this sort of mentality. And I think, I know we talked about Asia, where they have a huge population constituency that dwarfs ours, and these many different um, socio-cultural identity factors that might contribute or might hurt that sort of endeavor. Or then when you have other countries that I think, when we're talking about Latin America, when we look at the case with Venezuela where they, for years, been violating numerous human rights, um, but then was also considered 
a heavily democratic legal system, even more so than us, where they have the Supreme Court justices democratically elected, and then we yet see the sort of violations that are happening now. Like, I guess, how would we try to address these challenges, you know? Thank so, you. Uh, a great question, and it's what I've been thinking about uh, anticipating today's discussion. Last year, during Human Rights Month with WCL, I participated in a panel here that was about the rise of populism and human rights protection. And I think it, it, it's, it's related to the challenge that you describe. What do we do when these norms aren't popular or don't have um, domestic constituencies uh, behind them uh, or we see a backlash for the kinds of institutions we need to realize them like an independent judiciary? Um, that's a today challenge that maybe the founders of these documents couldn't have anticipated in, in 1948, but what, what, what well, are your thoughts about that? There's also, there's also um, apart from the serious, serious situation which we've been seeing in the Commission about lack of independence of the judiciary in, in our region, is, is also the conduct and speech of those in political power. They use their platforms to ensure that there is regression and there is lack of uh, respect for human rights norms. And that has happened more and more. Uh, um, so I, I, I think our problems, I, in fact, I, we had a, a, a press uh, meeting and meeting with Nicaragua about Nicaragua just, well, two meetings before I came. Mm -hmm. uh, <laughs> and, and one of the things I, I said to close the thing is that we have too many populations that are now so frustrated and have no confidence in political uh, um, institutions in their countries that they are, they are staying away from the polls and, and therefore leaving them open for all sorts of kooky people to get into power. Uh, and, and, and then you know the old adage that uh, people get the government that they deserve because if you don't use your, your, your right to vote uh, and, and effectively choose the kind of governments you want, we're, we're not in a position to ensure implementation of, of, of rights or decisions of international bodies that these states are bound to, to implement. So it's, it's, sometimes I feel so frustrated I want to climb up the walls. Tom, you, you uh, are a survivor of the <laughs> Holocaust and uh, a period of, uh, another period of kooky leaders. <laughs> Uh, and uh, it, it must be striking uh, to, to see what we see today and think about that history and that these documents were meant to protect us against this, what we're seeing today. Help us well, put that me, in perspective. Uh, thanks for asking me to speak on this. Uh, uh, we forget, I, I think we should start a little bit with history. Nuremberg and the Holocaust produced international human rights. Mm -hmm. That's where it all started. That's why, that's why the Euro European system was born as a result of it. So these things are related. And then once the European system worked, other countries looked to it and, and uh, tried to imitate it. It worked in some places, didn't work in others. And of course, it'll work only in places where there's not a totalitarian regime or something else. But on the other hand, there's been a lot of pressure in the past on various governments that wanted to be totalitarian uh, to not do it. For example, Poland broke away recently, Hungary was mentioned and others, in part because some other purely de good democratic governments have not put pressure on those countries to adhere to human rights. And so what's happening here today with, uh, with President Trump is that, and the US, in, even though I always criticize the US for not adhering to instruments, mm -hmm. the US has been a major power in promoting human rights in different countries. And that's all gone today. 
And so you, there's no pressure coming from here mm -hmm. and consequently also not from various other countries and we're not going to get any place. Mm -hmm. I, I don't wish on anyone mm -hmm. another Nuremberg and another mm -hmm. Holocaust. Mm -hmm. But we need to keep the history in mind, how this happens. Uh, and we need to focus on history. Uh, let, let me just give you a little history. Uh, and that's why I thought we were going to talk his, about history here. And that's why I prepared. Uh, and we've gotten away on things that we, we read in newspapers. Per, pardon me for putting it that way. Uh, when, when I started to teach human rights in the United States, there were two other people teaching it, Professor Henkel at Columbia and Professor Sohn in the United States, uh, I mean, at Harvard. I came to it, that was all. We then brought the casebook on international protection of human rights, then 11 countries joined, 11 professors in different laws. And so the whole impetus developed, but in the meantime, there was always pressure from the United States, despite the fact that we remained out of these instruments on countries to promote human rights. We don't have that today. And so the, I'm very, I, if this continues, we're going to see a complete unwinding of the advances we've made in human rights because of the fact that countries that were leading in the human rights field are now today being paralyzed. Uh, that means uh, we, we need to promote uh, not too ambitious projects, but focus on what's going on in various countries. Uh, promote the European system, for example, promote the inter-American system, promote the African system, and shame other countries. Uh, I'm not seeing that. Well, I think the roles of NGOs, I think you know, but we have too many NGOs, but, if you're probably well, saying so. But too many NGOs in who the, are taking a lot yeah. of money away from the few who yeah. could make, this, make a contribution. But I That's think, truth. I think though, that, uh, Tom, that uh, you can hardly, if you look at the difference uh, from many, many years ago, first of all, with social media and so forth, we know about atrocities immediately today. Uh, it doesn't help uh, us very much, unfortunately. And well, you know, it, it certainly makes the the Sometimes dinner time it, it uh, a, a little less enjoyable. Yeah. But the fact is, we instantaneously know things. But I think uh, that uh, uh, the global movement still is able to mobilize shame, and is still able to keep pressure on governments. I absolutely agree with you about the United States, and mm -hmm. I will, uh, you know, and it just didn't begin now. Uh, under the Bush administration and so forth, when the United States was beginning extraordinary rendition, and it was quite clear that we had the leaked memos and so forth on the euphemism enhanced interrogation and the like. And I had the portfolio uh, uh, briefly within the UN and so forth on terrorism and human rights, and I dealt with a lot of governments and so forth, and other you know intergovernmental groups. And, and I remember that uh, uh, I spoke to one of the governments and whatever, and they said, they said tell me what, when you guys put your house in order, you come back and teach, you, you come back and talk to us. Or when guys like Dershowitz and so forth start talking about torture warrants and the legality of things, and things that we thought were well settled in the law and so forth, and now the notion of the ticking, you know, the, t the, the ticking bomb scenario and the justifications for the use of these things. Uh, this erodes, I think, respect, and we're talking about torture, we're talking about fundamental norms. But there's another thing that I wanted to say, and it may very well be, Madeleine Albright, other people are drawing parallels and so forth to the rise of fascism in Europe, late 20s, 30s, and so forth. You know, it depends so much how much you have in the rule of law. And again, I get back to this separation of powers and a strong independent judiciary. Mm -hmm. And in many of the countries where we're seeing the erosion, mm -hmm. civil society institutions are not as vibrant and as strong as they are, for instance, in this country, which will oppose and litigate mm -hmm. anything that the president does, whether it's an environmental issue, whether it's a workplace safety issue, or whatever, where they're trying to roll back things. We have litigation mm -hmm. in our courts function in many of these other countries that emerged for, particularly from the Soviet bloc and so forth, they were still in the process of building the rule of law. 
But there's something else which is very dangerous that I have seen. And, uh, uh, and, and, and that is many of uh, uh, people uh, have lost, and whether or not it's in this country, but in many other countries, the notion of being left behind, whether it's from globalization or governments that pay no attention to their needs or whatever, it is easy then to start sca scapegoating mm -hmm. people. You know, and so what was the Jews once now are the migrants and the Muslims and so forth, or the people with darker skin, and, and we're seeing those things happen. But we have to resell the notion of why the rule of law is relevant. And the rule of law is not relevant to most people. We have to be able in a simple way to communicate to them why it is important you know, that you be able to press a claim and to vindicate a claim and you're not repressed for that. And that authority is held accountable. People don't seem in many of these countries, including, for instance, here, where a substantial amount of people, you interview them and you care if foreigners may be manipulated or even uh, change the outcome of the election, no. I, I, I mean, this really bespeaks of uh, very, very deep problems. So there are certain similarities but, uh, the, in these countries, but the thing that I look at is from the perspective of human rights law, and not just human rights law, and civil and political rights, it's absolutely, mostly domestic constitution. I mean, it tends to mirror constitutional protections. And, and, and the thing of it is, is that uh, if the judiciary is under the attack, if it's starved from resources, if judges are impeached or removed because of unpopular judgments, which is happening around the world and so forth, then things are in trouble. So what do you do? This is where there has to be the mobilization of shame, where the U.S. played a good role. You know, I, see, I oppose very strongly many of the Reagan administration policies when I was at America's Watch and so forth. But the thing is, the Reagan administration could still speak and hold other states accountable. In the, we may have had a double standard. We've never had consistent standards, not under Obama nor under Carter. But the United States had a unique position where we could mobilize and put pressure. And since the Bush administration, except for, because let's face it, Obama it wasn't a huge priority for Obama. Not at all. It certainly was a hell of a lot better than what we had under Bush. But now we have absolutely squandered, and I don't know if we're ever going to be able to convincingly get that back with the rise of China and other countries that are utterly hostile and still talk about human rights as domestic intervention. Can I, can I just, I just wanted to say, say, say this, in, in the Commission and in the UN, the mechanisms of the UN, and the Commission, we uh, have decided to work closely together in close collaboration because we both systems recognize, remembering history in all the mm. times, we um, s were separate. We all did our things separately. And so sometimes the UN would go into El Salvador and do something. Two months later, the, the inter American system went in, and that's that, that we are trying to stop that mm -hmm. now because we think it's ineffective and will be far more effective to get back and the attention that the, the, the human rights uh, law needs to have if we work together. Interesting. And we are, we are, we are working in, in that way very often. My rapporteurship actually, women's rights, first started it and then we are moving to other. Uh -huh. um, um, That's really interesting. That, that actually goes to a question that I was going to pose, which is picking up on, on something Tom mentioned about the normative mm -hmm. transformation of these documents over 70 years mm -hmm. and the role of institutions mm -hmm. uh, in, in doing that. And my question was going to be, is that a, a history that has really been a regional history? Uh, a lot of what you, you know, you've been talking about where a lot of the action has been in the regional institutions or ha has, has, has there been, you know, a global, global action that has been important there or national in, in, you know, the legislature of Jamaica? Is that where the action has been um, uh, in implementing rights or a combination? Well, I think, uh, I think 
I'm glad you did. You raised the special because actually we haven't focused at all on the role of the UN. Mm -hmm. Surprising. Mm -hmm. And in fact, despite what we sometimes hear in this country about the UN, it's, it's doing a good job in many places. Oh yes. There are individual committees mm -hmm. I, I've served, happen to have served on three of them. Uh, independent people, it's not political. Mm -hmm. They do a good job and they promote human rights. For example, mm -hmm. the UN Human Rights Committee mm -hmm. uh, is doing a great job. Uh, and that's where, in terms of outside Europe and other places, mm -hmm. the only influence that we can have is through the UN. Mm -hmm. So by, by making the UN look bad, we're not going to get any place. We have to work on the UN, try to improve situations, and accept the fact that it's a political organization. When we talk about be being politicized, what do you expect? So it's the OAS. <laughs> yes, but what do you expect in the UN? So you have to work with it. Uh, and uh, the UN has come up with, many, with much progress. For example, most of the human rights documents we have from the racial convention, torture convention, all come out of the UN. And enforcement has been a problem. We have ours now. Yes, but because of the UN. <laughs> well, although we did, although I must say, the intermar <laughs> unfortunately, we have the unfortunate. And, and Tom, you were very well, no, but because ours, of, ours be but because of enforced <laughs> disappearances in certain ways, unfortunately, we led the way in this hemisphere. And it goes, you know, it goes back to Velazquez and so well, forth. I, I and set on the yeah. cases of the sure, American Sure, that's Europe the whole thing. And that, disappearances. And, yeah, and, and we led the, uh, But we had, we, well, I yeah. was there much earlier. Exactly, exactly. Uh, the, the point that I'm trying yeah. to make is that uh, we should, if we want to really promote human rights in the world, you have to do it with the start with the UN. We can, of course, all of the regional activities are important. And they, they supplement the UN. But that they don't take over. They can, the inter-American system can't have an impact on Asia. The UN can. So it's very important uh, that we don't lose track. I was struck by the fact that we've been here now an hour. And I'm the first person to have mentioned to uh, the UN. And that's the... But I talked, of, I talked about collaborating together. <laughs> All right. Um, members of the audience, chime yes. in. Post questions. I've got a whole passel more, but uh, I don't want to monopolize the, this wonderful panel. Yes. Hi, my name is Wendy. I'm a recent graduate from GW Law School. Um, and I have two different questions, if I can remember both of them after I talk about them. Um, just uh, my background is studying what's going on in China. I've lived in China, I went back to China. Um, and U.S. policy towards China for the past 10 to 15 years has changed from being focused on human rights, the U.S. reaction to what happened in the early like 1990s, to essentially saying that we will put economic cooperation between our countries ahead of any individual concerns about specific human rights cases or forced detentions or internment of uh, my ethnic minorities or things like that. Um, and so you guys talked a little bit about this, but I was wondering if you had any personal strategies you used or arguments that you used for how to convince other people that those aren't things that need to be subjugated in order to ensure that there's economic cooperation. Like how do you, how do you convince someone who has a firm belief that economic cooperation is the most important thing and everything else falls to the wayside that these other issues are just as important long term for the benefit of not just the individuals affected by this, but also the system as a whole. Um, and then the second question I had was uh, about the United Nations. And um, as the really only international system that can address these issues, it's definitely a tool to be used. But I'm also wondering if you see a space for other types of universal systems to come in to fill the gaps that are left by the flaws of the UN and how it exists today. Um, and the fact that the UN, um, for all the wonderful things it's done, is also reflective of a, of a political system and a power structure that doesn't quite exist anymore. 
Okay, two, we could have a whole nother month on those two <laughs> questions. Uh, but let me, let me ask our panelists to speak um, maybe first about the, the economic case for human rights or that this is, this is not a fault, this is a false trade-off um, between economic development and, and relations and, and human rights. Yes. Well, you, you know what is interesting? Do you realize how many Chinese students study in the United States today? That's, that'll have a tremendous impact. You can already see what's happening. So they, it's not just economy. It's that them coming here and seeing how the system works has an impact. And when you read about what is happening in China, it, you see that they're not just all following the star, but there are actually a lot of lawyers, young lawyers working on human rights in China going to prison. And so e economic cooperation is good because in some ways it sort of uh, weakens dictatorial systems when they become dependent on, on economic aid and assistance and trade. Uh, but the important thing to my mind is letting individual in, in those countries uh, push themselves and have an imp when they study abroad, when they come back, they've changed. And that's where the future of China is going to come from. It's not only what they study here, but they also study in many other countries in, in the world. It's in the long run more important than economic cooperation, except economic cooperation has the advantage uh, that it's easier to promote human rights when things are going well in the country. <laughs> so it's, it's good, and if the cooperation with, with the United States and other Western countries is also good, because they can't just accuse all of these countries of terrible things at the same time cooperating with them. So uh, I'm all in favor of that, but I'd like you to remember cultural cooperation, relations, like students coming many people going to China. I should tell you, I, I wrote a book a few years ago which has just been published in China. It deals with my experience in the Holocaust. Why would they want to publish this book? I don't know to this day. But it's wonderful to see. I don't understand a word of what, whether they translate <laughs> it. <laughs> but it's, and they're publishing other books like this. That's going to have an impact. To me, that's the most important thing in the long run. And, and what about our challenge about the future of the UN, getting past a 1948 UN to a 2018 I, I UN? I tried to, to start a UN. Uh, the, the chance of doing that is, is you're not going to get any place. The trick of the UN is to slowly try to have greater impact in the co various committees and councils of people who are independent. And that is happening in various committees where they're independent, so, some are so-called independent people because they're government representatives, but others are truly independent people. Uh, and that has an impact. And don't get impatient. I, when I was your age, I was yeah. told by my professor, don't be a patient. And now I find myself saying the same thing, and it's true. All right, Bob? Well, I think also your question was aimed at bilateral relations. In other words, it's part of the diplomacy and so forth. Uh, that, uh, and we've seen it's not just that in terms of official U.S. diplomacy, but, you know, if Disney has a movie and the Chinese don't like, you know, and they say to, to Disney, they say, guess what? If you go to distribute this thing, you don't get your, your theme park. You don't get to do anything. It's going to be, it is the biggest market in the world. And the question is, no government bilaterally, the United States, nor the Europeans that take human rights into consideration, have a consistent policy. And, and sometimes the, uh, quiet diplomacy with certain countries works effectively, and one has to explore that and so forth prod them on certain, but this is where I think, and Tom is right, I think the Chinese have unleashed something that they will rue the Communist Party because they're sending hundreds of thousands who will become the next generation of intellectuals and scientists. They've seen what freedom's like. They've seen what, you know, whether they're going to Britain or France or here or so forth. They're going to go back and that is going to eventually have an impact. But this is where civil society organizations, 
you know, again, they have to mobilize shame. Put the Chinese on the defensive and keep the pressure on your respective government and so forth of why are you not raising this? Why are you going to this and they've arrested these dissidents and so forth? Why aren't you doing that? Keep it going, keep it on the, on the agenda. Uh, the other thing that I would say in response, I, I, I agree with Tom that in certain ways the UN, it has the global perspective. Uh, but in terms of effectiveness and so forth, I think if you look at the history of the inter-American system and the history of the European system, it's hard. They have had a greater impact. Part of it is because they have courts, and the UN does not. There's the no UN has an international court of justice with, and various other but, courts. No, no, but it, but they don't, have, they don't they don't they don't have but, but Tom they've been talking about having what a about human the rights tribunal. Court. What about some of the other tribunals? No, but those they deal with individual criminal responsibility yeah. for violations of in very they get their hands on a few people and so forth and so on to be very honest. But I, I think they've been very important. They led to to the ICC. But I think that the human rights regional systems have had a major impact and more so than the than I think the universal system. Uh, uh, there are things that the inter American system was able to do. I know in the case of the Inter American Commission working with the court during the Fujimora Mori era, by virtue of reports, on-site visits, and everything else, it finally got the OAS to do what it was supposed to do. The UN couldn't have done what the Commission essentially did in a variety of fast-tracking of cases to the court. And basically, it was the Inter-American Commission's final, that major report on the eve of the General Assembly of Windsor, where the whole thing then focused in on the OAS could no longer and it marked the beginning of the end of the Fujimori era. That would not happen under and what the And what to the other parts of the world? Well, no, but I'm saying, mm -hmm. look, but I'm saying where you have a strong regional regime, I, I, I think those have played a very, very important role, a complementary role. But as I said, I, 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 you know, I, I am a big believer in, in, in the effectiveness, and I would love to see a regime in the Middle East and a regime in, in Asia, but I can tell you, they are not going to look like the regimes uh, in, that we have in Europe and in the Americas. They simply won't. And that could pose certain problems, too. Because That's, then, of course, the problem that I, I feel yeah, very strongly about. Yeah. Since they're not going to be, yeah. you don't have the Then the universal ones goes to get. No, but yeah. we, can't, we, can't, we must have the yeah. UN. No, there's no question about yes, that. Yes, we, we, we other must. other questions in the audience. The, the the case of China puts in my mind uh, a question that I have for the panelists about this history and these documents, which, of course, had an integration of economic, social, and cultural rights with civil and political rights, and then the, the transformation and the implementation over seventy years has pulled those two strands apart, and they've gone down different paths. And reflect on that history and its implications for today. Did that you know, leave us at a, in, in, in a, in, uh, weakened in a conversation with China about rights? What about that history? I'll you yield to Tom on this. I can say I missed what you said. <laughs> Economic, social, and cultural rights, and civil and political rights in in these in in these de declarations seventy years ago were integrated as uh, part of a, a a set of norms, and yet as as that normative transformation and implementation has unfolded over that 70 years, the, those two sets of rights have gone down different paths. What has that meant for the health of the system today? Well, I, let me tell you, it first started uh, with the United States and uh, the Soviet Union. The United States opposed any economic human rights. Yeah. So, uh, and of course the Soviet Union wanted economic things because they didn't want civil and political rights. <laughs> And economic things, they could always say the camera things up. So uh, that's sort of the history of it. The truth of the matter is that you cannot really have civil and political rights without economic rights. I mean, we, we kid ourselves. 
uh, it's important to have courts and everything else, but if people are starving, that's not going to help very much. So it's important to also have both and insist, and usually in democratic countries, most of the time, economic and civil uh, rights and civil rights I, to some extent, equally respected. And I think that's, in the long run, the, the answer. And I, as long as ideology doesn't come back and the, the way we argued that the most important things were civil and political rights, mm -hmm. it, I, I don't buy that and I think that was a big mistake. Mm -hmm. Even the US has gradually worked it itself into the position where it recognizes uh, the importance of economic and social rights. I think the two of them have to go together. The sustainable development goals, of course, uh, the UN sustainable development goals, kind of reintroduce, reintroduce an integration of these ideas, I yes. think, in, a, in one document in interesting ways. I think the inter-American system were rather slow in developing um, our economic, social, cultural rights. And it's just last year we um, set up a special rapporteurship on economic, social, cultural, and environmental rights. Um, we, and, and the court, too, has only done two judgments, I think, on Article 26. Um, so we're rather slow. Um, but but th I think that's part of the fabric of human rights. I think we develop and expand and recognize and make um, justiciable uh, um, certain rights that we would then decide to uh, must be addressed, that we maybe forgot to address or didn't have resources to address or what have you. And we also set up un um, three units, um, the rights of the elderly, um, the, the um, memory, truth, and, and justice. And what's the third one? Disabilities. This persons with disabilities, mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. which, which as I said, when we were setting them up, I said, my goodness, we were rather backward in these things. You know, but, but that, I think, does happen sometimes. Mm -hmm. uh, um, but perhaps in that way, we were not as advanced as the uh, universal system in recognizing these, these mm -hmm. rights and making them. But it's, easier, so now. it's easier to advocate civil and political rights than economic and social rights in, in many ways. But, but I think the underpin, the way the, the way the world is today, they underpin everything. We have to have. No, I'm talking the, about the inter-American system. Oh, right. It was much easier. Oh, I've, I I've been in, yes, involved with the inter-American mm -hmm. system mm -hmm. for many years. Mm -hmm. It was much easier mm -hmm. than get into the economic mm -hmm. uh, problem. Mm -hmm. so, we started first mm -hmm. with economic and, and I mean with uh, civil and political, political rights, mm -hmm. and to some extent we've been extremely successful mm -hmm. in some parts of mm -hmm. Latin America, mm -hmm. uh, and, and uh, not not as successful as us in the Caribbean, <laughs> <laughs> uh, which I, I'm playing to you. No. <laughs> <laughs> but but I, I blame both no, no, it's sides. That's true. It's true. The both sides are to blame for that. Well, you know, but, but there's been a very creative use. Mm -hmm. Certainly, uh, I haven't kept track of what's been going on that closely since, since I left the commission. But we were really tackling in, with, <laughs> through the use of provisional measures and other kinds of things, dealing with health care issues. Mm -hmm. and, and, you know, when you start dealing with allocation of resources mm -hmm. in health care, it's just not a very easy thing. I mean, I thought when we were deciding a couple of things that if I was the Minister of Health of that country, in the commission end or whatever, the court has to decide something. And, and they're saying, well, you're not giving these people with AIDS and, and, and we have X amount of budget to deal with health care. We're not a relatively, uh, we're not the United States, you know, we're not Mexico, we're not Canada or whatever and so forth. I would have said to the commissioners, I'll tell you what, you come down to our country and you take over and, and, and you allocate the health care budget. We were treading on some very, and we negotiated these things out, but increasingly, under the guise of civil and political rights, we were dealing with, through right to life and so forth, we were dealing with issues that involved not the traditional thing of disappearances and murder. We were dealing with 
sustainable life in communities of indigenous communities and other kinds of things. So it maltreated. So we were dealing with, and I agree, but it was easier. And let's face it, with the birth of our system, you know, by the when this was in, Tom knows this very well, when this was being negotiated out and so forth, uh, uh, the whole Southern Cone was, was, was under democratic governments. By the time the American Convention came into effect, the great majority of countries and people in the Americas lived under military dictatorship or, or, or governments under military tutelage, weak civilian governments. In the kind of cases or the kinds of complaints, you know, that the commission was getting, disappearances, torture, murder, and, and, and that was, that was, if you're dead, you got no other rights, and that became the grist and so forth. So, I mean, these things are, are uh, we weren't dealing like in Europe, where the you know the original seven or whatever members you know had strong rule of law. You know, basically they agreed to rights that were already strongly entrenched in their own constitutions. They had they had progressive welfare in many of them, and so forth. Uh, things that still we can't get done in this country. So different histories, and I think that that plays into into why there has been the slower progress and so forth. And the United States is also the 100-pound gorilla that does not exist, and it's always been that way within the inter-American system. In the Europeans, that is a different thing. They don't have, they haven't had to deal with this reality of America and so forth. And the Caribbean only yeah. started being independent yeah. in the yeah. 60s. Yeah. Mm -hmm. yeah. Mm -hmm. okay. And then you got all that Victorian law. <laughs> Right, and you kept it. Where the English had gone in advance so much, I always, uh, I, I must say, I was very amused that I found that the colonies, and particularly in various parts of the Caribbean, they were more English than the English. That the English had oh, moved away, oh, yeah. you and know, they the, the mandatory, they kept law. all these arcane things and traditions, and the British themselves. That was moved. the platform I yeah. love it. Well, <laughs> this is, yeah. yeah. Just a little bit of history. Wonderful. Well, that's very, that's you very. Know, that, that means yeah. Yes, Tom. What you said yeah. because it's very true. Uh, I was on the first Inter-American Court when it was first mm -hmm. established. Mm -hmm. It's now celebrating its 40th anniversary, mm -hmm. and some of us are going to be there. Yeah. Yes, me uh, too. When I yes, I know. <laughs> when when we got there, and this is what Bob was pointing yeah. out, there were only three governments in the region, leaving out the Caribbean. Yeah. Uh, Costa Rica, Colombia, and Venezuela that were not under military or other yeah. dictatorship. Mm -hmm. yeah. mm -hmm. And it's mm -hmm. changed yes. Yes. dramatically. Yes. Yes. So it, it, yeah. a lot of things, but, impressive yes. things yes. have happened. But some, some heads of democratic governments are acting like dictators. Well, that's true even in demo really democratic <laughs> countries. <laughs> we have to keep the commission busy. <laughs> yeah. Other questions from the audience? They seem to be tired. They are yeah. weary. Well, let's, let, let's, let's wind up then and, and with one last question to each of our panelists. To, uh, we've been talking about this 70-year history. Let's cast our eyes forward and let me ask you what you see on the horizon. Um, what are the challenges that remain for realization of these aspirations? What might we see? 70 years from now. Wow, that's a long time to look. <laughs> some, but some of these people in the audience will be here. <laughs> I'm sure. Why don't we ask them? <laughs> <laughs> that's a great idea. That's a really good idea. What do you want to see 70 years from now? Yes. 
think so, coming from your point of view, it makes sense. But I, I just, I'm just thinking about the intermarital system. And I have to think of, um, from the basis of what it is now, the declaration is now for the intermarital system. It's a very important instrument in, in the application of the norms, uh, um, especially against the United States. <laughs> United States falls under the jurisdiction in, in, and lots of judgments, um, um, decisions have been made by the commission against the United States applying um, norms of, in, the, in the declarations. And of course, um, uh, the majority of Caribbean countries, independent Caribbean countries. And um, so, if we take the position that the United States will never ratify convention, um, mm. then the, in the declaration will still hold the position it holds today, I should think, as, well. uh, um, as long as there is a commission still existing. And, and, um, and let's hope that, because I'm one of the things I'm working on is to get the Caribbean states to ratify the convention. And, but if some do not, they would also be in that position. It would remain a vibrant, important instrument. But uh, 70 years is a long, long, long way. I, I really can't think that far. Uh, and it's an impossible figure for me at my age. <laughs> but, but certainly, I, I, I think even sort of say 20 years from now, I can, I can deal with and, and I think it will still be extremely viable and valuable for us to exercise our jurisdiction and, and make rec recommendations. Diego. I'm thinking you're probably, I would love to see the European Union still existing at that point, you know, more contention. Yeah. But I was going to, to ask you, how about a, a world court, you know, a world human rights court, would that be feasible? Would it make sense to do that? Uh, in implementation, in national implementation mechanisms and IMs beginning to resemble some of those that exist in some of the, of the treaties. Uh, as, you know, a better articulation of international mechanisms with a national level in different forms. Yes, I, I have promoted that very strongly. But the problem is uh, you, can, you have to do this slowly. Uh, that is to say, if you want to have a UN Human Rights Tribunal, you have to decide how you start. If you start with everything, you're not going to get any place. So uh, one thing would be to have a UN court that basically deals as an appeal tribunal from the various human rights committees. That would be one way. Mm -hmm. uh, the other way would be to have it serve, have only advisory jurisdiction to start with. Uh, and there are uh, a number of other ways uh, like this. Uh, I think the advisory jurisdiction, limited initially, uh, might well work. And there might be a lot of support because there are a lot of countries that are dissatisfied with what the committees are doing to them. Uh, so all of these things have to be thought out, and I think, definitely think it would be very useful to have a UN uh, human rights tribunal, but not necessarily universal, but limited to a certain type of problems that concern the United Nations in, in general. It, it's possible, but maybe uh, in 70 years we'll have it, but I think it'll probably take less time. Could I, I just say that uh, I, I, I agree with Tom. This is a case where it, it has to be incremental very much. and very careful. Uh, I certainly, you know, it, it, it would make sense that if one, for instance, could appeal decisions of the, of the uh, human, you know, human Rights Committee or whatever or a limited other group, uh, that will be a source of alarm for many states and so forth to begin with. But within the UN system, that's one thing. But there have been very ambitious proposals, as you know, uh, that somehow would also subject the possibility of almost a, forced in, a fourth instance or an alternative to the jurisdiction of the Inter-American Court or of the European Court of Human Rights. And that starts to pose some different question because, I mean, just get into very practical issues of what instrument are they applying, to what extent are they bound by uh, 
you know, we don't have precedent, but come on, we do have precedent and so forth. So it raises a lot of very, and I, so I think an incremental approach uh, on, on this. Let me just say that I see in 70 uh, years uh, only that I think civil society will become stronger. And I think they're the key. Civil society, we never would have gotten where we are without civil society pressing governments. I mean, most of these treaties, by the way, are not written by a lot of governments. They're written in consultation and frequently. They're NGOs that come to governments with drafts of these things. And, and, and uh, this is very, very good. What happens is the governments and the players are going to shift. You know, the Nordics were the most wonderful places in the world, and as long as they were getting highly educated uh, refugees, uh, doctors, lawyers, politicians uh, from the southern cone of Latin America who looked like them, who had Western traditions and so forth, you know, they were a wonderful place. Now, all of a sudden, when less educated, different skin, different religion people are coming in, it is starting to threaten, and we're seeing kinds of things. The Netherlands, one of the most tolerant societies in the world, we've seen the rise of people like Wilders and so forth and so on. This is going to happen. But the pendulum, just like I believe domestically, no one has a crystal ball, but we do tend to right ourselves over time. When we go too far over one way, there's a realization. And, and what's good about civil society institutions and free press, which is very, very important, you know, uh, is it does help to write things. It keeps the pressure on and it does shame. So I, I, I think this is going to be key to any advancement uh, in this area. And in this sense, uh, I am relatively optimistic that we're going to go through bad periods, but ultimately we will come back to, I think, greater protection. I, because I, 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 I am not as optimistic as mm -hmm. <laughs> either side of me about uh, a World Court or any other tribunal being set up even to examine uh, decisions of the committees. I don't think we'll have enough support. The politicians as they exist now, I think if they had a choice, they would do away with lots of what we have in place and do and will not put anything in instead. This 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 I think is a true and it it's true fear. Uh, um, because I remember when we were the, um, um, working on the um, elements uh, of, of crime and, and the uh, proce uh, procedure, uh, rules of procedure for the International Criminal Court. It, it was amazing how, if, especially the US, the, the kind of blocks they put in, in, in place, because I, I was a member of the of Women's Focus for Gender Justice, plus the Coalition for, for the International Criminal Court. And if it, I would agree with you, if it wasn't for the civil society there, lots of states would have buckled yep. to US pressure and bribery. And it was us forcing them, getting them away to talk and browbeat them and so on. That helped, you know. But you know what is interesting, since we have a 70 years, we have a lot of time. <laughs> <laughs> Not me, I know. No, but let me tell you, neither <laughs> I. But uh, the push for an international criminal court started in 1960, basically, with mm -hmm. Costa Rica introducing mm -hmm. it. Mm -hmm. And it was just recently established. Yeah. So 70 no. years may be too long. <laughs> <laughs> All right, I'll be Sorry. more impatient. That is, that is I, I, I think we've Great. come to the end of our hour and a half. It looks they, like there may be a, a, more, more questions. Not questions, statements. We'll take, we'll take three questions or statements and then wrap up, starting here. <laughs>
push on the state to sort of respect uh, human rights obligations and is being killed at a rate that hasn't been seen before. And so um, I guess I would have liked to have heard your thoughts on what you thought was what we needed to do with regards to that problem. To protect civil you know, society. Yeah, because we depend on them. Mm. Right. Could I give you? Could I just give Before, you an example of what you're? Nope. Yeah, we're going to take okay. three questions okay. and then yeah. answer them all together. <laughs> um, then there's one here. Yeah. So civil society, yeah. hold yeah. hold it. Mm -hmm. Okay, great. And one last year. Fortunately, mine is thematically connected mm -hmm. to this. Okay. So earlier I heard two different comments that made me think about the, like the future of the UN and its relationship to, dom to domestic, not just domestic civil society, but also NGOs from regional level all the way down to grassroots. And I, many times tonight, Rob, Robert has said very positive things about just the number of, of new nonprofits and the, amount, the sheer amount of people that are working on promoting human rights, but also I heard Tom say there are too many of them. <laughs> and it's, and that, I hear that feeling a lot about whether, who, who's working on different human rights issues, are people accidentally working against each other even if they have a similar purpose? Um, and is there, in the future, like I'm just thinking in the future, is there a way that the United Nations can become closer to civil society? Or if cool. that, you, you know what I mean? Or if, or if maybe that's not necessary because we'll just have more of civil society moving upwards, working through more collective means. But okay, yeah. Uh, yeah, great. So three questions. Maybe I'll give um, our panelists each, each an opportunity to answer any of them or all of them. Um, do you want to start? Bob? Well, let me just say on the uh, issue of human rights defenders, this is nothing new. We just know more about it. Uh, but I can tell you, at least at the regional level, uh, and I can speak from my own experience of having in the repertoire of the Commission for Columbia and having gone to Columbia three or four times a year for eight years, and by the time I left, we had put on 100 provisional measures. And I can tell you, we saved many lives. We save communities from being wiped out. Uh, we saved uh, other people, uh, the classic uh, uh, groups of people. And, and if people started getting hurt, then we went to the Inter-American Court, and the Inter-American Court made, and we created a price and so forth. If you look around the world, the Europeans were able to do certain things. But even if you look at intergovernment, the, the behavior of the mobilization of shame, Putin goes out and with impunity around the world, starts attacking, murdering journalists, and so forth and so on. It's having a cost. And NGOs, and I think we have within the UN and so forth, uh, uh, they can be very effective. Uh, uh, you know, special rapporteur on dealing with human rights defenders. I know when Hina Halani had it, it was extremely effective and so forth. So this is going to take place. Regimes will do these kinds of things, but there are more voices today than there ever have been. Uh, to denounce these kinds of things and to put pressure. So it's going to happen, uh, but uh, I, as I said, mechanisms are in place, and in many cases, I think that they have been, but for these mechanisms, I think a lot more people would have died. Um, 
as, as in relation to human rights defenders, I, I think there are more are being killed now, as indeed there are more of them yeah. um, as well. And there are, in fact, more voices. And, and, and it seems to me that every time one is killed, it raises more voices than mm -hmm. there were before. So you, you, I think you're very right in what you say. And what we, as you know, <laughs> we signed an agreement with the Human Rights Commissioner um, in relation to defense of uh, uh, human rights defenders and to work together um, to and see how we can really protect them better uh, um, and get uh, the provisional measures because some are even killed whilst they are. Uh, have provisional measures in place and, and so on. But I think that by and large, both uh, systems are doing all that they can um, to protect uh, human rights defenders. Um, I think the UN was in fact closer to civil society in the sense of uh, having the consultative status and all this and permitting them to speak and, and, and all that before the inter-American system. Have started doing. We haven't gone as far as the UN has. We are, and in my in my reports yesterday, what is yesterday, whenever it was, um, um, I did say that we are working on closer participation within our systems and our mechanisms uh, to work uh, with to work closer with civil society. And I think we must, and we have to be far more transparent with civil society in the inter-American system because they are the engine and help us with our work. Um, um, I didn't know to the third. Security Council. Hmm. No, I think I leave that. <laughs> <laughs> I, I missed the Security Council. Security Council reform, and, and is, will we see that in 70 years, and will that help human I mean, rights? It's not going to happen in 70 years. Mm -hmm. uh, uh, you know, because given the way this has been set up, Unless some country just drops out of its own volition, uh, nothing is going to happen. Uh, but let me just defend myself for a minute about too many NGOs. And the problem is NGOs depend on money. The more of them you have, the less money that the group has. And nowadays it's very easy. You and I could just set up an NGO and go collect money. And then we are what is happening, and I give you my example. When I served on the UN Human Rights Committee, uh, we asked the NGOs to give us documents about what was happening in various different countries. Just tell us what, so that we can ask the government yeah, what they're sure. doing. We would get, just on arrival at, in Geneva or in New York, 200, 300 pages of documents. Who can read that? Why do you think they did that? Because that's what they submit to their donors. If they submitted to their donors two or three pages about what was important, they would have helped us immensely. But since they depend on money, and since the more of them there are, the less money is available, the less effective they are. I mean, that's sad, because I'm, I'm a great believer in NGOs. But we, we have to restrain the development of so many NGOs. We started, uh, the, the commission that Bob belongs to now, they were really the first. Yeah. Uh, if you ask now how many others have oh. sprung up, uh, in, the United, in, in New York we had one NGO when I started in this yeah. business. And now everybody, anybody, I see kids growing, graduating from law school starting their own NGO. I mean, this is crazy. This doesn't help human rights at all. This helps them. I'm all in favor of helping them with, with funds and with jobs. But that's not, we shouldn't, in other words, NGOs are good, but let's not believe that the more NGOs we have, the more good work is going to happen on the contrary. We have to restrain. The foundations has to have to be much more careful to whom they give money and, or, and have human rights in mind rather than just being able to advertise what they've got. So uh, don't buy all that stuff. 
Okay, well, rich conversation and uh, some real challenges for us to work on for the future, for the next 70 years in terms of strengthening civil society, making sure that it's effective and focused and coordinated, um, continuing this, this normative evolution of the law and, uh, and strengthening implementation. So, and, and a work plan to establish a court in less than 70 years uh, to do so uh, well, I'm globally. Going to be there making sure that Excellent. <laughs> Excellent. Please join me in thanking a really incredible star studded. <laughs>